Good morning, everyone. The song of the gospel really has two verses. And verse one declares that we are saved by the great work of Christ, by trusting him. Verse two says, we are indwelt by the powerful spirit of God. Salvation includes the act of saving us and the act of sanctifying us or making us more and more like Jesus. As the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, we begin to sense our hearts beginning to change. We would expect as such, correct? As we're looking in this series entitled Overflow, we're looking at those types of changes that we might expect and with which we can cooperate. And one of those changes is in the area called compassion. Christ, who has been so kind to us as he lives within us, begins to turn us into compassionate people. And acts of kindness or mercy or or, or compassion, uh, they don't have to be forced. They overflow out of the presence of Christ within. So as we look at this today, I pray that He will reveal to us the ways in which he is activating that aquifer, that inner spring of compassion within each and every one of us. We offer a prayer, a prayer crafted by Travis that we use to begin each message. So as the words appear on the screen, would you please offer this prayer with me? Good Father, tell me my purpose and tell me your plan and tell me the truth of who I really am. Give me your spirit to see as you see, to know why I'm here and what my life means. Awaken our hearts and drench us in truth. We empty ourselves to be filled with you. Pour us out, Father, wherever we go, so others drink deeply from your overflow. Amen. At 7.51 a.m. on January the 12th, 2007, a young musician took his place standing against the wall of a Washington, D.C. metro station. He wore a long sleeve t-shirt, jeans, and a Washington Nationals baseball hat. He carried a violin case, which he set on the ground, opened, removed his instrument, and he tossed in a couple of dollars and some change as seed money. And he began to play. He played for the next 43 minutes. He performed six classical pieces. And during that time, 1,097 people passed by. Of those 1,097 people, seven, only seven, stopped for longer than 60 seconds. And of those seven, one and only one recognized the violinist, the acclaimed Joshua Bell. Three days prior to this metro appearance that had been staged by the Washington Post as an experiment, Joshua Bell filled Boston's Symphony Hall where the just fairly good tickets went for $100 a piece. Two weeks after the experiment, he played for a standing room only audience in Bethesda, Maryland. Joshua Bell's talents can command $1,000 a minute. But that day in the subway station, he barely received enough to buy a cheap pair of shoes. Can't fault the instrument. He played a Stradivarius violin worth $3.5 million. Can't fault the music selection. He played a piece from Johann Sebastian Bach that Bell called one of the greatest musical achievements of any composer in history. But scarcely anyone noticed. How do you suppose that happened? Might it be that we just don't expect to see such beauty in the, bi- in the midst of busyness and such majesty in the midst of mundanity? There he was standing, shoeshine stand to one side, kiosk to the other that sold lotto tickets and newspapers. And no one expected it. Besides, everyone was so busy. It was the morning commute for crying out loud. It was Washington, D.C. for crying out loud. Mainly government workers scurrying to budget meetings and and management sessions. Who would have thought? Do you think that when we are in heaven, we might look back on these days that can be so busy 
so cluttered. Do you think it might dawn on us as we look back at some of these moments that we say to ourselves, oh my, that was Jesus. In the blue jeans, the long sleeve t-shirt, wearing the Washington Nationals baseball hat. That was, that was Jesus who needed a seat on the bus. That, that, that was Jesus, the, the receptionist who seemed emotional and face full of tears. That was Jesus in the orphanage or in the jail. That, that, was, that was Jesus. You know, there are many reasons to help people. In any conversation about compassion uh, surfaces some valid reasons. Benevolence is good for the world. We all float on the same ocean. When the tide rises, it benefits everyone. Uh, To reduce poverty is to reduce atrocities. Compassion has a dozen advocates. But for the Christian, none is higher than a very unique, remarkable promise. And that is when we love them, speaking of those in need, we love him. That when we love them, depending on what circumstance, whatever marginalized, vulnerable person we may encounter, we're actually loving Christ. I didn't make that up. That comes right from the teachings of Christ. In fact, it comes from his final sermon. His final sermon. I don't know what I would teach. I I have a few ideas, but if I knew that today was my final sermon, I'd give careful thought to what my final sermon would be. And Jesus, knowing this would be his final sermon, uh, told a story. And this story is found in Matthew chapter 25. And if you have your Bibles, and I hope you'll you'll bring your Bibles, you'll open yours to Matthew chapter 25 or open your phone or, or smart device. I don't know why they call them smart devices. I don't feel smart when I use them. I I feel intimidated. Anyway, I'm beginning in verse 31, and and the reading is a bit lengthy, but I'm not going to cut a word. Beginning in verse 31 to the end of the chapter. Jesus said this, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was thirsty and you gave me no food. I'm hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not minister to you? And he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I could hardly imagine a story more graphic. This is the message that he saved until last. I wonder if he wanted to imprint this message on our conscience. I think we might understand this story, this parable, by dividing it up into three sections. First, we'll look at the setting. Then we'll look at the separating 
And then we'll conclude by looking at the significance. The setting, the separating, and the significance. The setting is the final judgment. The great day. Uh, The book of Jude calls this the great day. And on this day, Jesus will issue an irresistible command. And all people will come. All burial sites will be abandoned. All people will come. From royal tombs they will come. From paupers' graves they will come. From forgotten battleships they will come. All the bodies of every person will be brought And the paradise will release the spirits of those who have been saved. Hades will release the spirits of those who have been condemned. And the bodies will be reunited with the spirits. And we will stand before God in this, the great gathering of people. The great gathering of people. All the angels will be there. How many angels are there? We don't know. There is a passage in the book of Revelation that talks about 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 angels. I take that to mean nobody can keep up with them. They're everywhere. Turn a stone and clip a wing, they say. Angels are everywhere. But all the angels will be there. You'll see the glint of silver off the wings of angels everywhere you turn. And you'll be in that great sea of humanity. Your children will be there. I'll be there. Our ancestors will be there. But I dare say you may be standing next to some of the most famous people in the world and you will not notice. You may be shoulder to shoulder with Marco Polo or Napoleon Bonaparte. And you will not turn to ask him any questions because all of us will have eyes for only one and that is Jesus Christ who will be seated on the great throne. Elsewhere, he says, the Son of Man will come again in his great glory. Same way you have seen him go into heaven. He will come back, the Hebrew writer says a second time. Not to offer himself for sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So this is the setting of this parable. And that is the great day, the second coming of Christ. Intrinsic to this parable is the separating, the separating. Jesus at some point will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides sheep from the goats. I've been told by those who know these things that shepherds still do this to this day. Uh, That they will walk into their flock of of sheep and, 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 and where there might be goats that have come into the flock, they'll separate them. And they'll do so with their staff, just a nudge of the staff, pointing one one way and pointing sheep the other. What a graphic thought to think that someday our good shepherd will walk among that great flock of humanity and he will nudge you and he will nudge me, some to the right, some to the left. Ronaldo over here, Max over here, Maria over here, Thomas over there. We cannot read this story without thinking what in the world will determine the separation. By what motive, uh, I'm sorry, by what criteria will Christ separate us? He explains. Those on the right, the sheep, will be those who fed him when he was hungry, brought him water when he was thirsty, gave him lodging when he was lonely, clothing when he was naked in comfort, when he was sick or imprisoned. And the sheep respond with, I think, it's the most sincere question, and that is when. I've noticed that people who do the most really think they're doing the least. When have I ever done anything? When? And Jesus will answer with something like, well, you remember that time you got off the subway there in Washington, D.C. And you were in a hurry to get to the meeting. And there I was playing the fiddle, standing up against the wall with my violin case open. Everybody else hurried by and you started to, but then there was some tug in your heart. And you came back and I know you were in a hurry because you looked at your wristwatch twice. But still, you heeded your compassion call. You bought me a coffee and brought it to me. I remember that time that, that you got to work and you were already running late for the meeting, but you noticed that the receptionist, she's brushing away tears all morning and you just, 
you couldn't get down the hall. There's something inside of you that said, I've got to go find out what's wrong. Remember that time? Remember that time you showed up for your class, that group of elementary school kids, and, and there was that one kid who's typically rambunctious and a bit rowdy, and he showed up with some kind of mark on his cheek, and you're concerned what happened, and you weren't about to let, to let that go unnoticed. Remember that time? And Jesus will go time by time by time. Remembering the deeds done while in the body. Remembering the deeds done during this short, short interval on earth. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10 says that God is fair. And that he will not forget the work that you have done and the love that you have shown him by caring for his children. You and I will forget but he will not forget the deeds done. So Jesus will recount one by one all these acts of kindness, every deed done to improve the lot of another person, even the small ones. In fact, especially the small ones. Jesus does not say, I was thirsty and you drilled me a water well, which would be good, but, or I was I was sick and you built a hospital or you got a degree in advanced medicine or I was in prison and you lobbied for a new system and the, some people are called to that but, but his point is I was thirsty and you just gave me a drink well I could do that I was hungry and you gave me a water burger I was lonely and you remembered me and sent me a text the small, simple deeds are those remembered and noticed by Christ. When Francis of Assisi turned his back on wealth to seek God in simplicity, according to the story, he stripped naked and, and walked out of the city. As he left the city, he noticed a leper standing on the side of the road, and he walked over to the leper, and he embraced him. And then he continued on, and after a few steps, he stopped and he turned, and the leper was gone, and for the rest of his life, he told people, that leper was Jesus Christ. May have been right. Jesus comes to us in the form of the forgotten and the abandoned. So if one would see Jesus, one must see the ones all others forget. Society celebrates celebrities. But Jesus celebrates the neglected. So I think we can draw the conclusion from this parable but let's make sure we do by looking at the significance of it and let's be careful I do not believe for a moment that this parable is teaching us that we are saved by being good I do not believe for a moment that this parable is teaching us that salvation comes to those who do a lot of good stuff and that salvation is a consequence of doing the right compassionate deeds if so that would fly in the face of everything else in the New Testament that teaches us that we're saved by faith in Christ and we're not good enough so do not turn stories like this into yet another legalistic system that causes you to say well have I done enough kind deeds to be saved to go to heaven the fact of the matter is we do not do good deeds in order to be saved we do good deeds because we've been saved Amen. we do not do good deeds whatever they may be studying the Bible coming to church Loving the, the needy. We don't do those in order to be saved. If that were the truth, that's a legalistic system that no one can keep up with. But we do these things because of that miracle of salvation. We are already saved. We are secure in our salvation. And the Holy Spirit has taken up residence within our hearts. And he's beginning to reclaim his territory. And he wants these hands to use for his purpose. These eyes to see as he sees. This brain to think as he thinks. This tongue to talk as he talks. This heart to love as he loves. He begins reclaiming us. And so our privilege is to cooperate with this reclamation project. Our, project, our, our privilege is to say, come on, Lord, take over. Take over. Do what you want to do. Turn me into a tool of compassion. Kindness and compassion are the natural outflow of the redeemed. So I urge you just to take a couple of practical steps. 
Number one, seek the Lord in prayer. Seek the Lord in prayer. Homework assignment. Lord, what's my unique assignment? Some of you already know. You have prayed this prayer. Consequently, you go to the prisons. Consequently, you go around the world on a mission trip. Consequently, you write generous checks that most people know nothing about. And you're glad to do so because it is the work of the Holy Spirit within you. Uh, Some of you have prayed this prayer. Consequently, you're mindful of your neighbors. You're aware of the recently widowed man, or the man recently a widower. You're aware of those who are passing through times of difficulty. You just have a a radar, a Holy Spirit radar that makes you sense it. And God bless you. God bless you. Others of us, maybe we could develop a bit more in this area. And so say, Lord, what's my unique assignment? What's my unique assignment? How can you best use me? Oh, what an adventure awaits us all. And then having... As you seek the Lord in prayer, serve the Lord in people. Because we're learning that the Lord is in people. The Lord is in people. He's not in some temple on a mountain. But he's in people. And you will, by his help and under his guidance, begin to see people in a different way. No more racism. Uh, Skin hues are his idea. No more gender arrogance. I didn't vote to be a man. You didn't vote to be a woman. It's God's idea. So let's just trust that. No more hostility between nations. None of this. Do you not agree with me that the world is in need of a dose of kindness? There's so much anger in the world. So much hostility in the world. And I got to tell you, with another presidential election coming up, it's going to get worse again. It just gets all stirred up. Oh, God. God. Release your church as a quotient of kindness to kind of calm the fires of anger that stir up. And let's not be on those bandwagons. The message of Scripture is you want to see Jesus, you want to serve Jesus, serve people, see people. If I were to tell you that Jesus pulled up in his car out here as a visitor in our parking lot and he doesn't know what door to enter, man, this room would empty. I'll show him. If I were to tell you that Jesus has taken up residence in a convalescent home and hasn't had a visitor in a month, oh, you would be there in a heartbeat. If I were to tell you that Jesus came here from another city, uh, transported by the military to one of our military hospitals for special treatment, and, he, and that person has, he, 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 he has no guests, nobody comes to see, you'd be there. So you know what I'm telling you? Jesus just pulled up in our parking lot. And he needs somebody to show him the right door. Uh, Jesus is in the convalescent home. And he needs somebody to sit with him as he eats. Jesus is in the hospital. In the form of a lonely person. And when you go to them, you go to him. For many years, David Robinson and his wife Valerie were members of our congregation. Some years ago, they left to help plant a church, God bless them, on the other side of the city. We loved it when they attended here, and we remember David. We know David is an icon in our city, right? NBA, MVP, all-star, seven feet, two inches tall, muscular, statuesque, ripped. Kind of reminds me of me sometimes. <laughs> I still recall the first day he entered our church. It's way back in the early 90s. Our church was meeting in a smaller building on Fredericksburg Road. Back in that season for whatever reason I would issue the welcome at the very beginning of the service and so I was issuing that welcome when I looked up in the center aisle and here he comes what an imposing figure not wanting to attract attention but he can't avoid it 
every head turned toward him. People were elbowing. This is all I could do to get everybody's attention. From my vantage point in the front, however, I, I was afforded a, an awareness of another visitor who entered at about the same time. Coming down a side aisle, a homeless man had wandered in off the streets. And he was everything David was not. He was stooped. He was frail. He was weather beaten. He had a gnarly beard and long hair. Who knows when he had last had a bath. Carried a, some kind of sack. A grocery sack. Pants were baggy. Old tennis shoes and old shirt. The congregation was thrilled and enthralled by the presence of the all-star, but with only one exception, nobody noticed. The street dweller. But I'll always be grateful for that one exception. John Pruitt, an elder in our church, tender-hearted and kind, still an elder to this day, made it a point, if I remember correctly, he left his seat and went to the back and walked around and came down and he found where that homeless man was sitting and he sat next to him lest he feel out of place. I've sometimes wondered if that homeless man was a messenger of sorts, maybe an angel in disguise, divinity wrapped in simplicity, sent by God to test us as a church, to test our willingness to love the least of these. Let's pass that test shall we? Will you resolve in your heart as I'm resolving in mine to seek to to cooperate with the Holy Spirit who lives within us in those moments in which we can be a, 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 a source of compassion toward others. He has been kind to us, so may we be the same to others. Amen. Amen. Lord, let us now receive this message in our hearts and do with it as you will. It is not my desire, Father, that anybody feel uh, guilty or, or condemned. That's not your tool. You love these children. You love all of us. And we do volunteer, Lord, to be used more. And just show us, Lord, how can we be more generous, more available, more useful. Thank you for how you have used us. And we do volunteer, Father, to be used yet again. Through Christ we pray.